question and discussion. I'm going to introduce both of the speakers, and then uh, they'll share their conversations. So Donald O'Shea is the president of New College. He arrived here in 2012, and he's really focused his time and attention on increasing academic excellence, increasing diversity, and a more robust student life. He's a firm believer in collaboration, so he did partner with uh, the other colleges I just mentioned to start the consortium here. He's also very involved in education himself. He's immediate past president of the Southern University Conference. He's part of the Strategic Planning Committee for National Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges. He earned his BA from Harvard, and he earned his uh, master's and PhD from Queen's University, and all of it is in math. And uh, he has uh, quite a brain for mathematics, <laughs> and which you will hear. <laughs> uh, Anne-Marie Russell is the executive director of the exciting new Sarasota Museum of Art, which is part of Ringling College Art and Design. And she re received her BA from University of Colorado in Boulder in cultural anthropology and her MA in art history from the University of Arizona. And she's had quite an illustrious and varied career. She worked at Christie's Auction House in New York for 10 years where she designed and taught master's degree courses in modern and contemporary art with an emphasis on connoisseurship, the art market, and history of collections. Now, if you can put all that together, that's pretty remarkable. <laughs> she arrived here in May of 2015 and to lead the Sarasota Museum of Art and her vision, her implementation of space and program in the Samoa, which includes planning art experiences throughout the entire site of 10,000 square feet, which is coming along well, I believe, uh, includes uh, art gallery space, educational and interpretive programs, a sculpture garden, re retail space, cafes, classrooms, and studio spaces. So we're eager to have that as part of our community. She's also an authority on Native American, Oceanic, and African art. And she views her role as museum director as one who facilitates engagement between art, the artists, and the community. So we'll hear a little bit more about how that will transpire. And I have to say, you're in for a real treat. I've heard these two have conversations at various uh, places, and it's this vibrant, dynamic conversation. They both get so excited, they're talking so fast, so you have to slow down so we can all understand you this evening. So I welcome Anne-Marie Russell. Thank you. Oh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, excellent. Um, let's go ahead and get the slide started. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. The new topic series is so wonderful. I think we have Frankenstein coming up next on the 13th, so I hope you'll all be here. Um, it's such an honor to be part of this, so thank you so much for having us. Uh, tonight is a celebration of art and science, and I think especially a celebration of the interdisciplinary liberal arts education that is embodied in the New College Experience and in the Cross College Alliance. Tonight is also a celebration of creative and intellectual friendships, and it's a celebration of, I think, a very charming coincidence, and I hope you are as charmed by it as Donald and I were. Um, art, math, and Orange Peel's The Legacy of Dr. William Thurston. I think this is... This could be not as interesting if I can't make... Oh, there we go. Okay, our story begins a number of years ago when I was invited by the editor of a French uh, glossy fashion and cultural magazine to write about a collaboration between a fashion designer and a mathematician. The fashion designer is a man named Dai Fujiwara, who is the creative director of the House of Miyake. You might be familiar with the fashion designer Issei Miyake, who's most well known for these pleats, pleated things. This is an Issei Miyake dress, uh, no pleats. They're not actually very flattering on most people. And by the way, this came from eBay. Thank you for my cute husband. Um, so he collaborated with a mathematician by the name of Dr. William Thurston. This is Dr. William Thurston, who uh, this uh, sentence, mathematics is, an, is the art of human understanding, I think really embodies Thurston's sensibility. 
Now, it might seem odd to you that a mathematician and a fashion designer would collaborate on a project, but these art and science collaborations are quite common. I think we can think of Leonardo as our, oh. That's okay. Am I doing this right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we can think of Leonardo as, of course, the father of art and science collaborations. And I think while it might seem curious to see these collaborations today, I think what's more curious is the division between art and science that we've developed. They used to be a more united set of practices, and I think a more forward-thinking interdisciplinary approach that we're encountering today uh, is more in line with that. So for a more... I'm not very good at this. What am I doing wrong? Oh. More recently, of course, we can think about Picasso and Einstein and their creative collaborations and their inspiration. You know, so many times when we have scientific discoveries, when you hear about those eureka moments with scientists, there's often a work of art behind that. Either the scientist had been looking at a painting or listening to a symphony, something prompted something that opened up the way the scientist was thinking um, that was inspired by art. And many artists, of course, are constantly inspired by science. I think we can probably agree that Picasso might not have fully understood what Einstein was doing with his special theory, but it really doesn't matter because that beautiful, perhaps, misunderstanding resulted in cubism. So we get this gift. So Picasso is learning about what Einstein is doing with special theory, and um, he incorporated what he thought. He might not have understood it, but I think he knew that it was something really important and exciting and new and revolutionary. And we got a whole new way of thinking about art, and a particularly painting in the dimension of time. So it's often said that art and science meet in the space of wonder, which is a beautiful way to think about that. In the case of Dr. O'Shea and I, however, we met, art and science met at a dinner party. And I'm very happy to introduce Ed and Claudia Swan. Thank you for bringing Donald and I together at this dinner party. So I had written this article, and I'm at this dinner party at the Swan's house, and there are wonderful, interesting people there, very indicative of Sarasota bringing wonderful, interesting people together. And I asked Dr. O'Shea, well, what do you do? I'm a mathematician. Oh, what type? I'm a topologist, which means he figures out the shape of the universe. I cannot wrap my head around that, but it's, I know it's a big deal. And I said, oh, do you happen to know Dr. William Thurston, who is also a topologist? <coughs> And Donald said, no, I'm, this is why I'm here. Dr. W uh, Dr. Thurston actually graduated in the first graduating class of New College. And you might have guessed Donald's going to be doing the math portion of this particular talk tonight. <laughs> I've got the art part covered. Um, so we had this wonderful co uh, conversation at dinner. The next day, I sent Donald my essay that some of you might have. We have a copy up front from the, uh, the magazine about this collaboration. And then I received in the mail this extraordinary book. If you haven't read it, there are a few copies for sale. Um, I had opened my essay with a quote by Henri Poincaré, and I was so happy and surprised to find that Donald O'Shea had written this extraordinary book on the Poincaré conjecture. And I just have to, I don't want to embarrass you, but give a plug for this book. Now, my math skills are not strong. I cannot even help my poor, my father's laughing, my 11-year-old daughter knows I cannot help her with her math homework. But I'm interested in math, and this book is absolutely exquisitely written. And it's, it tells this wonderful story, uh, and it's filled with these absolute gems, like absolute precision buys the freedom to dream meaningfully. Dr. O'Shea talked about how the precision of math allows us to open up our thinking in other ways. So it's a beautiful book, and there are just a few copies. And he might even sign it if you're really nice. I don't know, we'll see. So we enjoyed talking about that, and we thought it would be fun to share this collaboration with you, the story of this collaboration. So Dai Fujiwara, the creative director of Isimeake, um, is what we might call a polymath, someone who's interested in a variety of different things and the inter interrelationships between seemingly unrelated things. It was actually a childhood fascination with wind that caused Dai Fujiwara to partner with the provost of the Royal College of Art in London, Dr. Uh, Sir James Dyson, someone you might be more familiar with because he might have designed your vacuum cleaner, the Dyson. Anyone have a Dyson vacuum cleaner? Brilliant, brilliant industrial designer, provost at the Royal College. He and Dai Fujiwara collaborated on um, 
uh, uh, one season, and you can see some of the results of that collaboration. So it was not uncommon for Fujiwara to partner with interesting people um, like Dyson to come up with his uh, next season's line. So Fujiwara's challenge as a fashion designer, of course, is to take something that's two-dimensional, flat, a dress pattern, for example, figure out how to connect the edges of something, turn it into a three-dimensional object, and then figure out how to put it on a body that's going to move through space in time. So it's a really tricky, I know that sometimes we think of fashion as this very superficial thing, but from an architectural standpoint, it's actually a very complex art form that's very challenging and takes a great deal of skill. So as Fujiwara began to work through these issues, he began to, he had a habit of doing something. There's a reason the oranges are here, if you're wondering what the reveal on the orange peel is. Um, we often talk about learning through making. In Western philosophy and sensibility, traditionally there's been kind of a divide between the mind and body, but we know that our brains exist throughout our nervous systems and in our hands. And many of you, even if you're not artists or makers, you, you move your hands around and you move your hands to think. And as you make things, whether you're molding clay or you're knitting or you're painting or even writing or doodling, you understand how it prompts your brain to work. So Fujiwara would kind of obsessively peel oranges, right? You have this sphere and peel the orange and spread out the peels and then put them back together to see different ways in which one might reconfigure the two dimension into the three dimensional. That helped him work through some problems with the fashion design to get the patterns for the dress. So he had this habit, you can see some of the orange peels pinned up on one of his boards here, and he found out through a mutual friend that there was someone else who shared the same habit of peeling oranges to make sense of two dimensional into three dimensional space. And that was William Thurston. So he contacted Thurston and the two of them got together and they ended up having a wonderful series of conversations. Uh, Thurston was at Cornell, and Fujiwara and his team would travel to Cornell and give talks in the math department, sharing with uh, Thurston's students what they were doing in the fashion design world and how they were developing a collection. Thurston would in turn go to Japan and visit the house of Miyake and talk to the Miyake team about what he was doing with topology. Um, and they had this wonderful collaboration. I think they really inspired each other. And that resulted in a pretty extraordinary set of the fall 2010 collection. And I just have a few images here. And one thing I want you to think about while you're looking at this Im these images, when artists are inspired by scientists, um, or in this case, a mathematician, the artist isn't illustrating the idea of the mathematician or the scientist. It's more of a prompt. Art traffics in ideas, and this was more of a creative exploration. Again, think about Picasso using um, Einstein's ideas with special theory. It wasn't about a scientific illustration of that theory. It was more a concept that prompted an idea and a creative exploration. So here are some of the, um, I think this might be going on its own at this point, um, some of the results <laughs> of this wonderful collaboration. And when Donald talks a little bit about the math behind all of this, I think it might make a little bit more sense. But regardless, beautiful, beautiful objects resulted. Yes, there we go. And this is Di and Thurston uh, taking their bow at the end of the runway. Um, the two of them, apparently, by all accounts, both of their writings um, and the photographs, they seem to really thoroughly enjoy this particular collaboration and really inspired each other. This is from a mathematics uh, journal where they talked about this particular collaboration, and you can see some of the shapes and forms that they began to work out, and these are, um, well, Donald will explain in a moment. Um, Dr. Thurston made such a massive impact in the field of mathematics, um, he came up with these theorems that were nicknamed monster theorems because their impact was so great and so large and so important and so beyond my ability to describe to you. So this is where I will turn this over to Dr. O'Shea and he's gonna tell you about Dr. Thurston and his uh, impact on the field of mathematics. So um, can everybody hear me? Yes. And likewise, thanks for being here. By the, uh, by the way, I, we've both learned one thing from this lesson, uh, from this um, collaboration, 
which is don't drink too much red wine at dinner. <laughs> and thanks, Ed and Claudia. Um, we, we did find out we shared um, one of our, a person in common. So let me, who was Bill Thurston? So he came to New College um, in the first class um, there. That was 1964. He was drawn, the college had put out by the way, some great admissions materials. People from that class weep when they think about how wonderful those admissions materials were. Thurston was drawn by two statements in them. It, one was, in the final analysis, each person is responsible for his or her own education. And the other one was, um, the best education is the, um, collaboration conflict between two first-class minds. Those sound a little dated now, but he thoroughly believed them. He would stay interested in education all his life. In fact, he organized when he was here a seminar on, um, on education, and he has written some of the most luminous pieces. He's a beautiful writer in education. We're not gonna talk about those today. The, the reason we're talking about Thurston is, as Anne-Marie said, he completely changed the mathematics that describes form, shape, and scale. Those, of course, are the same things that concerns fashion, but they're deeply concerning to mathematics as well. And how did he do that? He did it by asking the simplest questions and then following them fearlessly, and I would say rigorously, to wherever they led. So, what sort of questions? So, we'll, we'll, why don't we just get warmed up with one? Uh, imagine you're on this beach 6,000 years ago, it's in Western Ireland, um, and at that time, um, they, we didn't know as much about our world as we did now. And you, you look out, and you think, if I sail out there, not, you can see some mountains there, but out a little to the left, will I keep going forever? Um, or what? Will I hit a wall? Will I fall off? Um, and again, at that time, there was really no way of knowing. A few thousand years later, Brendan the Navigator would try that. Um, but in some ways, um, we, know the, we all know the answer now, of course. You can get up in space and you can look, um, but Magellan sort of showed that that distinction between going on forever and having a wall, that was a false dichotomy. We should have been asking, what was the shape um, of, of the universe and how do, uh, of the world, and how do we know it's got that shape? And in fact, when Magellan came back, all that he did was show that it didn't go on forever in one direction. I, I mean, how do we know it didn't look like that, the world? And it could have. Um, you know, it, it, so how would you know? So at any rate, with that warm up, after this talk, uh, uh, it's not as dark in Sarasota now at night as it was when Thurston was here. The first class lived on Lido Beach for a while until the college ran out of some money and then moved them to the horse barn on campus. Um, <laughs> but it was dark. You could look up at the sky, and people have looked up at the sky forever. And if you look up, uh, those same questions come to mind. What is, if I go straight out, what's going to happen? Well, will I go forever? Or maybe the stars will all peter out, there won't be anything. Or will I hit a wall, a boundary of some kind? And it, it's still the case, no one knows. A lot of us, a lot, think they do. But if you look at the lesson from Earth, the questions we should be asking ourselves are what's the shape What's the form and what's the scale of the universe? And now we can't cheat like we did on Earth because we're stuck in the universe. We can't get out of it and take a look and say, ah, 
It's, it's round, it's a sphere or something like that, uh, because that's essentially a two-dimensional object. The universe is three, and so we, we can't do that. So, um, and let me make one slight bit of mathematical editorializing. Um, shape and form aren't quite precise enough. So the questions we really want, and I'll explain what each of these means, um, is we want to know the topology of the universe. We want to know its geometry. Those are two different ways of talking about shape and form, but they're much more accessible to computation and to math, so we use that. And of course, the scale. Everybody, we're still talking about scale. So, uh, whoops, if we go back to our world, how would we know whether it was because whether it was a sphere or whether it was a donut, a torus, or some other surface, there's, there's infinitely many surfaces. Um, how do we know which one it is? Well, all of us have seen these pictures in high school or in grade school. This is a map of the world. You map everything out. And the answer, by the way, um, is orange peels, but we're gonna do the opposite of orange peels. We're sticking them together again. If you look at this map, I think there is a way to point here, but, I, oh no, yes. That line, the right side, is the same as the left side. So if you're at a point here, that's exactly the same as the point there. Those, those two are stuck together. If you go to the top, however, there's just one point there. That's the North Pole, that whole top line is the North Pole, and you've got some distortion there to make the map a rectangle. And if you go to the bottom, that's Antarctica in the center of that, that bottom line is a single point, the um, South Pole. So if you remember that, that that line is the same as that line, the top line is a single point, and the bottom line is a different point, the only way you can stick that together is a sphere. Um, it, it might be round, but it's a, a sphere. You've put the orange peel back together. What would, the, what would this map look like if our world were a donut? Well, um, let me see, did it advance? Here's a map if it were a donut. Um, it looks pretty much the same. The, this left side, and that right side are still the same. But now when you go up to the north, you hit ice. But the Arctic is the same as the Antarctic. That line up there is the same as this line down here. And so even though you couldn't get up, what codes the shape is how it's connected, how those maps of things are connected. That's called topology. Um, Math, um, the science of connection of shapes, how things are connected, that's what the world, word topology means. And one of the reasons um, mathematicians like that way of thinking about it is because you, the ways of keeping track of how various things are connected, they give rise to algebras or algebraic objects, and you can work with those. If you were to check our universe and you were trying to figure out its shape, what you'd do is you'd do the same thing. You'd make a big map of it, but now the pieces in the map are three-dimensional. They're not two-dimensional. And the shape of the universe will depend, whoops, excuse me, on how those, is that top bit, if you go out there, suppose this is the whole universe, where will you come back? Will you come back under here? Are maybe all these things go into one point? Or maybe you go out here and you come back here or over there. And you could have tens, hundreds um, of thousands of these blocks that need to be assembled. And um, they fit together. And that's um, an object where, um, like that, is called a manifold, a three-dimensional manifold. There's manifolds in any dimension. Their shape is determined, after you make a whole thing, by how they stick together. Many questions about that, much of the mathematics is hard, but the idea is simple. On that Thurston 
loved three manifolds. He, um, there are many, many more of them than there are surfaces. And you can get intimately familiar with all of them. So that's one of the categories. The other category is geometry. And geometry is a different way of looking at shape and form. If you, if you go out, I am absolutely certain, by the way, I have no way of proving this, that if you head out from Earth forever, you're, you're going to come back. I, I mean, it's just ridiculous <laughs> to think anything else. Um, it, it's, I, 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 I mean, and I, most mathematicians share this point of view. Um, but there's still a wide range of spaces there. So, but at any rate, then the question is, well, it must be curved somehow. So the thing that studies curving and wrinkles and crinkles, that's geometry. Now, most of the geometry we know, I've got three guys up here. There are lots in geometry, but they, they're representative. First one is Euclid. That's the geometry many of us that are of my age grew up with in high school. And even if you weren't my age, they still are teaching it in high school. It's um, Euclid wrote 10 books about. We don't know much about him. He lived from 325 BC around to um, 275 BC, maybe a little longer. It was in um, Alexandria during the reign of the first Ptolemy, Ptolemy Soter. He was in the library. Um, half of those books have been lost. Uh, the Elements, which is the book that came down to us, we actually have no idea why that was written. Everybody says it's got to be to teach school children geometry. It's <laughs> not at all clear. Uh, that was an entirely different society. And in fact, the earliest versions we have of the elements are at least 500 years after Euclid. And this is before the printing press. You can imagine the editorializing and stuff that went on. And um, some of them got translated into Arabic. There's an old Greek one that they actually only recent in the Vatican that, that seemed to be older than the one that was translated to Arabic. But we don't have, so although everybody says we know about Euclid as elements, and it is by, for sure, the third most read book in the world, and I think it's probably the most read book. The, the w ones that are before it are the Bible and the Koran, and the Euclid's been around a lot longer than that, and once it was translated, it immediately made its way into China and into India. But, um, so it's probably got a wider readership, but it's a bit mysterious. But, so what, but all of us are familiar with the elements. What the elements said, was there's some common notions, point, line, that sort of thing. We're not going to define those. And then it started with five axioms. The first one was between any two points, you could draw a line, a straight line. The second axiom was any straight line you had, you could extend it further. The third axiom was given any point and any line, there was a circle that had, was centered at that point and had that line segment as a radius. The fourth one was any two right angles are equal. And the fifth one was you take any two lines and you draw another line across them. If the sum of the angles between those lines are less than 180 degrees, then those lines will meet somewhere if you extend them. That was the fifth postulate. From that, Euclid went ahead and deduced everything we know about geometry, or everything known then about geometry, in simple, small steps. You got all those theorems we were tortured with, side angle, side, the medians of a triangle meet. Um, triangles have 180 degrees, the Pythagorean theorem, you name, they all came in a kind of beautiful logical progression. Thomas Jefferson had the um, elements on his bedside and would read it. Abraham Lincoln used to carry it in his saddlebag. It was a model of lucidity and um, uncomplicated, but thought that went very deep. The one problem was 
Nobody liked that fifth postulate. Um, it was, you know, you got two points, put a line between them. That's pretty clear. <laughs> um, but that fifth one, I, I didn't even pull in a, um, a picture of it. That just seemed messy. And people spent years trying to derive that fifth postulate from the other ones. Um, it was in the, by the time the 1700s came around, it was considered the greatest unsolved problem of human beings. In the um, great um, Middle Eastern Arabic societies, it was also considered the great, greatest unsolved problem ever. People worked on it. After the printing press started, there were, and 100 years later, there were 20,000 separate papers written on the theory of parallels, how you could get it from one to the other. No one succeeded. Then there was Gauss, one of the most famous mathematicians of all times. He was at the University of Göttingen, um, 1777 to 1855. Um, he had a background in surveying um, and was thinking, well, we should check if triangles have 180 degrees and things like that. And in fact, he wrote a book on the theory of curved surfaces. He tried to um, derive the fifth postulate from the other four. And then he was smart. He realized this is impossible. In fact, he realized that if you assume the converse, you get an entirely different geometry. It was all consistent. The thing was, he got this around 1822, 1820. Um, he didn't publish it, and the reason he didn't publish it is he was scared, um, and literally, because so much stuff had been written about how marvelous Euclidean geometry was, that to put that out there, um, he just didn't want to take the heat. There were a few others that did publish, Bolyai and Lobachevsky. They were really annoyed when they found out Gauss did it. Um, <laughs> Gauss, here's the next one, Riemann. One of the most interesting stories in the history of mankind, I think, humankind. Um, unbelievably shy, the son of a Lutheran minister. Um, he lived from 1826 to uh, 1866. Um, poor as a church mouse, he came to study um, theology in Göttingen. Um, he loved mathematics and he decided to make the shift there after writing to his father, of course. And um, um, he, in Germany, you, have, you do a doctorate, but then you have another doctorate, a super doctorate, a habilitation. And um, he, he had to choose a topic for that. The tradition is you give three topics to choose. He had made groundbreaking work in two of them. Gauss, his mentor, knew about and thought, said the other one was geometry, which he put in there thinking, that's never going to get chosen. And they did. And um, Gauss said this. So Riemann first had a minor nervous breakdown, but then gave this marvelous lecture in June in 1854. And what he did was he completely turned Euclid <laughs> geometry on its head and said, what do you mean this stuff about you don't define a straight line? We're going to define a straight line. It's the shortest distance between two points. You know, um, even on a sphere, it's the shortest distance between two points. That's what a straight line is. And then flat um, geometry makes that a definition. A surface or space is flat if the fifth postulate holds, if every triangle has 180 degrees. And otherwise, it's curved. And um, then he worked out a, a way of doing that. This, of course, became the foundation about 80 years later of um, general relativity, um, the, the Riemann's notions. Um, it, it was just an astonishing bit of work. So for geometries then, all of a sudden, we had three. We had flat. There is a flat Earth. Um, that was one where the curvature is zero. Take a line off of any line, there's exactly one point through it that's parallel to it. Um, every triangle has 180 degrees. Um, at the area of every circle is a constant, pi times the radius squared. Here is another, there two, turns out there's two cases for curved. I, and don't forget, this is a definition. One is, 
every triangle has more than 180 degrees. So, and there are no parallel lines. There are no parallel lines on Earth. You take two at the equator, the launch of the meet at the North Pole, they're not parallel. Every triangle has more than 180 degrees, and the area of any disk of a given radius is less than pi r squared. The area of that beanie, if you measure the radius around it, is a lot less than the flat piece. When you, and of course, that's the problem with peeling these things because they're curved. They don't, they've got less area. They break when you try to put them on a plane. They don't have enough area. Um, top of my head is sort of spherical except where it's flat. <laughs> so curved hyperbolic surfaces. This is one that's saddle shaped. Anne Marie has a bracelet in there with wonderful negative curvature. Um, well toned males and females have negative curvature on their side. I don't. I have a tire there. But um, <laughs> that's the um, Rokeby Venus. To cover her side um, perfectly, you would need a bit of fabric that I've, I've drawn up here that has, um, if you look at the radius, it has more area in it. it. You need more area to cover that. That's hyperbolic ge um, geometry. And so we wind up with these three possibilities there. Um, and, and then maybe 50 years later comes a theorem that no one was expecting. And it was the work of Klein and Poincaré, who Anne-Marie had, which was that every surface carries a unique geometry in which that surface is the most symmetric it can be. That doesn't sound surprising. You know, the sphere, a perfectly round sphere is nice. What about a torus? Well, and but a torus is flat. It, the Euclidean geometry, its natural geometry is Euclidean geometry. The, um, the, um, you've got parallel lines, never meet on it. Um, every triangle has 180 degrees. On a torus, not the one I drew here, but on the most idealized one. You just need one other dimension to put it in. But it is the natural way that that torus is. An easier way to see it is every cylinder is actually flat in this sense. Um, and then most surfaces turn out to be hyperbolic. It was known that this theorem was impossible in three dimensions. Nothing could be like that. But then, remember Thurston. We left him just after he left New College in 1967. He went to, um, to do his PhD at the University of Berkeley, California in Berkeley. Spent five years there. He then spent a year as a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. He then was an assistant professor for a year at MIT, and then he was hired as a full professor the year after um, at Princeton. And that was before he came to um, Cornell. Um, he had been thinking about these questions, and he totally changed what we think of in three dimensions. First of all, he asked, um, and it was well known that you could have flat geometry, you could have um, spherical geometry, you could have hyperbolic geometry in three dimensions. Um, it, it's not hard to show. He asked, were there other ones? And he answered that question. In fact, he knew the answer not long after he left New College. There were eight, just eight. So it, no one had asked the question really, and so you need to define carefully what you mean by a geometry. He did that. The names aren't important. The examples are beautiful in there. Um, so that was one thing he did. The other thing is it was known that any three-manifold, and that's just any shape that's possible for our universe, the possibilities, the, the mathematical three-dimensional shape, it was known that there was no way of giving them a unique geometry. You, you can think of examples immediately. But it didn't stop Thurston. He um, said, well, I can cut it up. And those can be given unique geometries. And in fact, he found a way to do it for a huge class of manifolds, ones that were large enough. And um, he completely believed that 
it, that would hold for every three manifold, and it was convincing. Anybody that went in to talk to Thurston would come out convinced, but it, it was too hard um, for that thing. Um, in 2000, it, it was called the Thurston geometrization conjecture. The exact statement is any three-dimensional manifold, any potential universe can be cut up in a canonical way so each of the pieces carries exactly one of those eight geometries. Um, you know, it may not be necessary to cut it up. You might have just one, but you could do it that way. In other words, geometry and connectedness, just like they were in two dimensions, were again related here. Um, and and it, it was, it was um, stunning, but no one thought it would be proved in this millennium. Well, right after, this is an invitation to a cocktail party in Paris, and um, in 2003, there were three postings to the internet from a guy called Gregory Perlman, who managed to prove it. Um, he proved it, and, and there were three fairly dense things. He managed to prove it by imagining that the um, universe was like a, um, he thought of curvature as heat, and he let it diffuse. And lo and behold, it broke into the pieces. Very complicated mathematics, but wonderful. And um, there was then this um, invitation to um, have a um, drink, and in fact, there was a whole conference, to celebrate the resolution of the Poincaré conjecture, which was a result that fell out instantly of theorems of um, Thurston's conjecture, and tons of other stuff did. I, at this, this was the last time I ever saw Thurston alive. I was, um, I talked to him. There was um, a conference, he used to meet in Cornell. The next year I was away on leave, and the year after I came to take the job at New College, essentially because of Thurston um, here. So um, it, 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 it's kind of one of those stunning stories. Let me say a couple of words about scale and let me um, end there. On scale, of course, is distance. We should ask, um, how big is our universe, for example? That, by the way, this was a big issue when Columbus went around. The Greeks knew that the world, and had a wonderful argument, was about 25,000 miles around. Columbus had another argument, and he thought it was 7,000 miles around. He was wrong, but he was right about it being a sphere. Um, at the moment, if you look up into that sky and you've got a good telescope, you can see out 42.5 billion light years. You can do that on the other side. So the diameter of our observable universe is, four, is 93 billion light years. Each light year is um, about 6 trillion miles. Um, so it's, it's big. And the <laughs> <laughs> there are fairly good estimates now for what's the piece we can observe, because you need to get there in order to make a map of the whole thing and figure out what the shape was. And um, the best estimate now is out of Oxford, and on, based on other theoretical things, it seems to be about 250 times as big um, and, um, as that. And, and that does seem to me to be a plausible argument. Um, so, but, so, that, so on the large scale, we know our universe is a pretty big manifold, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be infinite. It could be, of course, nobody knows for sure. And everybody's pretty sure there's no wall out there. <laughs> the, the other one is scale. If you take a, a piece of clothing, something like this, and on some hand it approximates a surface, but if you look at it closely, you get texture um, that one gets in fashion. And so here's a, a kind of plain region, but it's kind of ropey. It's got lots of little pieces in it. Here's another one with a different weave that, that you've got there. And there are many different weaves. If you, look at her, if you look really closely, you see a bunch of atoms floating around. In fact, it's mostly empty space. If you look really, really close, and this is, of course, the same in our universe, it does seem to be some quantum foam of some kind. Nobody really knows. If you look at the scale of human beings, though, on our Earth, our Earth, there's a couple of pictures. It's got these little bits of high curvature, of interesting topology. It's not really exactly a sphere. That one piece there makes it a donut um, in terms of connection. You got a few others, you got a more complicated surface. But um, so you've got 
areas where you've got slightly more complicated topology. But if you zoom out, um, it does start to look round. You also get some beautiful geometry. This is from Emory's Colorado, where you've got a beautiful sand, set of sand dunes. It's not flat. You've got mountains. They don't look like surfaces. Um, and of course, in our universe, we have um, little areas where you've got these high curvature. Those are sort of black holes or little handles. I'm going to stop there and hand you back to Anne-Marie. Thank you. But what I should say, what Thurston did then was he completely revolutionized those notions of geometry, topology, and he had a lot to say about scale. I just don't have time to tell you. back up and take us to the last slide, please. So we just wanted to close with a thought. I think while Donald and I are in such divergent fields, they're the uh, commonality among our conversations and our... Can we get that last slide up? Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you. There we go. Um, a, a number of things keep coming up. Curiosity, exploration, wonder. I think that what's really important to us, I had the wonderful opportunity to hear a lecture by a cosmologist by the name of Chris Impey, and he was asked, what is beauty to a cosmologist? And Chris Impey said, to a cosmologist, beauty is a moment of revelation rather than a moment of creation. And that really struck me in terms of what artists and scientists are doing. I'm getting away from you, so I'm trying to oh, reduce okay. the, um, I'm like, the feedback. <laughs> okay. No, no. Um, artists don't make things to produce an object or a product in the world. I think that they make things, they're exploring, and they make things and create things so something will be revealed to them. And that, I think, is exactly what scientists do when they pursue their curiosity to ask these big questions. What is the edge of the universe? You know, what happens when you keep going? So I think for Donald and I, I, I think I can speak for both of us, when what was really interesting to us is to use this lovely coincidence of our Thurston connection to have the opportunity to talk to you about art and science and our shared curiosity. She said it better than I can. <laughs> As I say, we're happy to take questions or, or not. People should feel free to escape if they want to leave. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I, I did promise Anne Marie I'd get some books, and then I totally forgot. And so she said, rummage around your office. And so there's some out there. There's not many. Uh, they're yours for 10 bucks. That'll go to the foundation. Um, but, um, and one's an English edition, one's a... No, and I highly and recommend. Just, again, and, yeah. I'm not, math is not my skill. No, I did not suffer the same fate as Hypatia, the female mathematician that was oh, murdered in so ancient sad. Greece. Yeah. But I was persecuted mildly by my eighth grade. Apparently I was okay at math until I was in my eighth grade geometry class and the math professor, who was also the football coach, um, made it very clear to everyone that he thought that girls had no business being in his math class. That kind of set me on a different path, but I have retained a great love for the concept of math, even if I'm not very good at it. So if I can make it through and thoroughly enjoy Donald's book, I highly recommend everyone get a copy. By, by the way, I do have something to say about, the reason we talked separately was so that we would let others have a chance. <laughs> Hypatia, had for a long time, which was, nor um, she was this wonderful Neoplatonist um, mathematician in Alexandria. Um, the, um, her version of Euclid, this was around 450, 500 um, a, um, and, um, after the Christ in the Christian era, um, she was just um, totally um, stripped naked, flayed, um, they just were out to destroy her beauty, her thought, um, her ideas. It was a bunch of Nestorian monks, um, yeah. unfortunately. It was a horrible <laughs> story. And when I had mentioned that thing about the Vatican edition, that was found to be a little older 
than, than her edition of Euclid. So fortunately, it's no longer as dangerous for women to be in math as it used to be. So anyway, thank you so much for being here tonight. Questions, anything else? Nope. Yes? Um, in three or four, well, in four manifolds, um, it's, it's known you can't put any geometries on it, but there is a list of about a thousand geometries. Uh, um, actually, the answer to that question is um, there are so many, it's hard to know where to start. Um, some, a lot concern, and this was some of Thurston's earlier work, how you fiber three manifolds. Some three manifolds have natural lengths. Other ones don't. We still don't know. We still can't figure out ways of doing that. If you take a knot out of the universe, you get another manifold. There, there, it's, would, it's always interesting to try to figure out, most of the time it turns out to be hyperbolic, what its volume is, and things like that. There's ways of computing it, but um, it, there's a bunch. Yeah. It's big. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the math side. The physics side's even worse. Yeah. Yes? What happened to Thurston? He, um, so he came here, um, he was a difficult student, Thurston. So the question was, what happened to Thurston? Why did he come here in the first place? Um, he was drawn by that material that said, every, your education, you're on your own there, and you'll have good profs. Um, and um, he had a very tangled time in junior high because he would challenge teachers. In high school, he kind of learned to, um, uh, to get along, in a way. So he, but he still hated it. Um, he came to New College. Um, he always gave New College the credit for how he had developed, because they really let him alone in some ways. And his other classmates challenged him a lot. There were some other really wonderful mathematicians in that class, including the woman who had become his wife. Um, he, he, he died. Um, in a sort of horrible, um, he got a melanoma inside his nose and it didn't get checked out. And um, it, it, um, it ate away most of his face and, and it was very aggressive. Died in 2012. I have a question. Yes? Um, the science of fractals, I think yes. that's fairly new science as well. I don't know much about it, but is that related to this type of mathematics? Yes, um, it, it, it's a bit different. Fractals are things that if you blow them up, blow them up, blow them up, they look the same in, in, many, in, in a way that you can define well. Um, Euclidean objects are the same too. If you blow them up and blow them up and blow them up, they look the same. They aren't as interesting as fractals. But um, it does seem like what's the right objects mathematically are ones that at a very small scale are fractal-like. Then as you go out further, they start to look like manifolds, Euclidean geometry, and so on. And so there's a close relationship. And fractals go back to the end of the 1800s. It's just they, they weren't so well noticed. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you know if anyone has uh, checked out a triangle in the universe if the sum is 100, 180 degrees? Uh, yes. And um, so there's a, one of the large questions is what is the global geometry of the universe? We, not every triangle in the universe is 180 degrees because the geometry varies. In fact, if you look around a black hole, the light curves, and you, what happens there is you get triangles. Don't forget a light beam follows a straight line. Or I, actually, I didn't say that, but it does. I mean, it's the shortest distance between two points. And there you get curvature that's positive. So you get triangles that are greater than 180 degrees. And in other regions, it seems that there's negative curvature. The current estimates show that the universe is pretty close to flat, to a 0.4% chance of, of error. Um, we're just not sure what the global, no one knows what the global topology is, or global geometry. 
But yeah, in fact, Gauss went and checked it out too, and it came to too close to 180 within the realm of measurement error. It's very hard to measure that precisely. So I'll share one more thing, that Donald and I also share a great love of another mathematician who we lost recently, Mira Mirzakhani, who made beautiful drawings of her ideas. Oh, yeah. And I think there might be an exhibition that we'll collaborate on at some point in the future. We will. So stay and, tuned for that. And she did flat geometries. She was this very, very gifted um, Iranian mathematician, came to this country. She was the first woman to win the Fields Medal. Um, Thurston ran, won the Fields Medal, which is mathematics version of the Nobel Prize. She died recently. Um, she was 40 of a uh, aggressive um, breast cancer, but it, very missed and very, very visual. And um, yeah, she was great. Yes? I have another question. So this is about the relationship for mathematics and fashion. And yeah. So as a look into um, triangles that have more than 80 degrees and you have triangles that have negative curvature, how are we going to design a dress that's going to say that? We well, debated we that. Talked, you go we ahead. Should, we we cut we out a third something. part of the lecture, which will be another lecture. But it's interesting because with a lot of computer modeling and computer-aided um, 3D printing and whatnot, fashion designers are actually getting into some interesting complex mathematical things that are resulting in some pretty extraordinary styles and kind of, you know, the, our human bodies are not evolving fast enough to adapt to what we're seeing. So that could be another lecture coming up. Stay tuned. Yeah. And it's a wonderful question because the question of how you can weave, and this used to be the time when you could weave or create fabric with given curvature. That was a sort of manufacturing question in a way, and it was mm -hmm. hard. It's hard to create something that's got all negative curvature um, and that looks the same at every point. In fact, you can't um, if you go far enough. But now, thanks to 3D printing, <laughs> you don't mind wearing a little plastic. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah, no, we were going to talk about yeah. that, and we thought, no, let's not go there. Um, yes? Uh, yep, that, uh, there's something, uh, yep, there, or at least maybe the same, because the universe <laughs> contains us, so depending how you measure complexity. Um. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see you on the 13th for Frankenstein. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donald. <laughs>